Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Navigating the Multimedia Maze, What Resources Can Engage an Online Learner? Presented by Dr. Ashley Robertson and special guest, Dr. Stephanie Vandeventer. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and hopefully you can hear me okay. I think we have all of our technology in order. Uh, I just wanted to start this morning uh, introducing ourselves a little bit and uh, to kind of give you an overview of some of the issues that we'll be talking about today, um, specifically with how we can support our students better, especially during this time, um, whether you're a teacher or a parent, um, with engaging in um, online learning, uh, because at, at this point, I think everybody has um, had to experience some form of it. Uh, so I am uh, Dr. Ashley Robertson. I am a graduate school professor at Kaiser University. Uh, I teach in the education department and um, most specifically in the curriculum and instruction and instructional design programs. Uh, I'm a program coordinator. Uh, also for our PhD in education programs. So I do a lot of support with the curriculum and building uh, our courses, uh, working with our instructors and professors. Uh, I'm also a dissertation chair, so supporting a lot of our students uh, toward the end of their PhD journeys. Um, and just as a little background, a lot of our students right now um, are experiencing a lot of these issues that we'll be talking about today, whether they have children at home or um, themselves as online learners. Uh, really have to, to think about and ponder uh, some of this uh, content that we're going through. Uh, I'm going to turn this over also to Dr. Vanna Venner so she can introduce herself and say anything else she would like to say about the content. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Stephanie Vanna Venner and I have been in the field of education for about 35 years. I've been with Kaiser uh, for the past eight years and before that, I, was, uh, I owned an instructional design business for quite some time in uh, Tampa, a very successful design business. And we did a lot of work uh, designing things for um, uh, kids in middle school in particular, um, tobacco usage, um, alcohol usage, things like that um, in Florida, Texas, New York, and so forth. And prior to that, I had a long career at the University of South Florida. So I've been around a while and uh, have seen a lot of this and have grown sort of grown up in this field. And I presently work at uh, Kaiser doing a lot of the same jobs that Dr. Robertson does, a few things that are different. And uh, my, my specialty being instructional design. And I just love that. I'm really, uh, it's, it's the one thing in life that I feel uh, academically is my home. I love instructional design, creating programs, thinking about the way things work best for learners and so forth. We are going to today talk about, and you know, this is a short presentation. It's really hard to talk about everything that could be done in multimedia uh, in an hour, but uh, we're going to touch on some things that might be applicable to you that you would find interesting to do, <clears throat> excuse me, with a class if you're a teacher or with your kids at home if you're a parent. And we're not going to delve deeply into any of these sites, but we're going to show you a lot of things so you have an opportunity to see some things that are out there and then you can further explore them on your own. So back to you, Dr. Robertson. Sure. Uh, so what we wanted to start with today is to talk a little bit about some of the problems that you are all, whether you're a parent, a teacher, a student, um, everybody, uh, with the issues that you're experiencing when it comes to learning or supporting learners uh, on this venture of learning online, uh, and more specifically, um, the, the multimedia and the technology that they're experiencing and how that can be better leveraged to uh, engage and to uh, help learners who are experiencing some of these basic problems. So uh, in terms of parents, um, there's a lot of helplessness and frustration right now. Um, I know you feel that you need to do something, but the problem may be you don't know exactly where to start or what you can do to help your child, especially if they're really struggling through um, being an online learner. Uh, in terms of teachers, 
Uh, a lot of teachers are experiencing issues with student motivation, um, frustrated parents, and having to keep and ensure that students are attending, that they're, they're motivated to do the work, um, while also navigating what type of help parents need, um, especially since that relationship between teachers and parents is now uh, a, a lot closer than it may have um, used to be. Uh, in terms of students, they're also experiencing a lot of new expectations and, and procedures. Um, they may not understand those expectations of learning, uh, especially when there isn't a teacher right there driving the classroom. Uh, and then in terms of everybody, the big question is, where do I start? Um, what is good technology? What is good multimedia? Um, how do I find something that's easy to use and, and it, that's safe? Uh, for the students and that kind of meets the purpose of what I'm uh, experiencing with uh, that student. So these are some of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. And in order to kind of um, first show you, uh, especially if you're a teacher, an example of a technology that can be used as a quick uh, pulse check or formative assessment, um, but also to help us gauge and do a quick pulse check with you, um, we want to put a poll uh, up on the screen for you. Uh, this is a poll called Poll Everywhere, and we have a link at the bottom, but I'm going to pull this up full screen for you uh, and give you the opportunity to answer it for us. So bear with me here. And this is an example of what poll everywhere uh, looks like. So there are two easy ways that you can respond to this uh, and those directions are right at the top and I think that the lovely ladies leading our webinar today are also putting these into the chat. Uh, but you have two options. You can either um, go on your phone or your email or click on the link in the chat that says pollev.com backslash Dr. Ashley. Or if it's easier for you, just grab your cell phones and you can text the number 37607. Just text Dr. Ashley, Dr. Ashley, and that will add you into this poll. Once you have joined, you can choose either A, B, C, D, or E as your response. So I'm just going to hold tight here, let you guys answer, uh, and then we will see where we are. All right. It looks like we have a pretty good response here. Um, we have uh, probably our largest issue with students staying on task. Um, that probably coincides a little bit with them being motivated and we'll definitely talk about some strategies today that can help you. Um, and then we have a couple participants who are looking for some support with finding resources. Um, which again, we will definitely talk about today. Uh, so this again was kind of a uh, two way model for you guys so that you could see uh, the way that a poll could be used, especially if you're a teacher. Uh, a lot of fun for the kids to pick up their cell phones if they have them and, and text something and see their answers pop up uh, right before their eyes on the screen. Uh, and it's good for you to kind of give that pulse check so you know where you can continue focusing in uh, your support with them. So I do want to thank you for um, taking part in that poll. Let me go ahead back up here and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Vanna Venner if she wants to talk any more on this about polls or Kahoot uh, before we move forward. No, I'm not going to mention anything further about that, but I will say we are going to talk about, we've got one particular tool we'll show you in a little while about helping keep students on task, which I think you're all going to love. It's easy, it's fast, simple, and effective. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Fantastic. 
All right, so uh, you all are going to see our agenda pop up periodically, uh, just so that you know how we're moving through this presentation. Um, this also is a great strategy for teachers if they're doing PowerPoint presentations or the students have to watch something, uh, popping that agenda up and doing little check marks as you finish something tends to be very motivating. Um, maybe because you know we're getting to the end where you can go and have your cup of coffee. Uh, but either way, uh, for students, they know that they're moving through that lesson and it's almost done. So this is just a an easy non-tech way uh, to, to kind of motivate them and keep them engaged into that lesson. Okay, right. so if we think about what are today's learning objectives, what we're, let's talk briefly about what we're going to do and what you'll get out of this presentation. Today, teachers and parents, we're going to show you the difference between, there's a lot of terms that are used in, in this field, and when you think about multimedia, we, have, we hear a lot of these terms back bannered around tools and resources and apps and platforms and curriculum and so forth, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, what those mean. And uh, so you can sort of tell the difference, especially you parents, when you're uh, working with your kids at home. And then we're going to give you some simple ways to vet some of these tools using some evaluation forms, one for teachers and one for parents. Uh, we'll also talk about ways to find tools and how to search for them and what to do when you get there. As I said, we're not going to be able to go through everything and actually finding these things is one of the most difficult things you're going to do. You, when you find a couple of good ones, you tend to use them over and over. And we're going to show you some today that are so extensive and uh, have lots of information that you could spend a great deal of time just researching, going through those, and finding ways to do things with your kids. We'll show you a few, and as soon as you see them, you're going to go, oh my goodness, there's so much here. There's so much wealth of information. I know all kinds of things I could do with my child at home just using this one website. So that's what we're going to do is to just show you some of those and then give a little demo of some of these and some of the resources uh, to support your students. Okay, so let's talk about this vocabulary as I mentioned a minute ago. <clears throat> Excuse me, we've got all the pollen and leaves and everything up here. It's just killing me. I'm in North Carolina. Um, I, pardon me for coughing. When you, th when you think about some of the vocabulary I mentioned a minute ago, learning tools, online resources, uh, parents, you may not know what we mean by an LMS, um, design presentation software, what's, an, what's online curriculum. These terms are used a lot of times rather interchangeably. Um, and, but they do have specific things. A lot of times the online tools or the learning tools are specific sites that are designed to do something in particular. And um, they are going to help uh, parents and, and kids with doing one particular kind of task. Um, Animoto, for instance, helps you create a video. Playposit is a place where you can add things to an existing video. So you can insert a video into something and then you can put comments to the side on play pause it. Uh, sometimes they do a little more than that, but these are some really interesting things that make it simple to do those kind of things. You can, um, on, with easily, you can develop some more advanced infographics. So if you've got uh, a worksheet or a report, you can make it look really uh, beautiful with using some of the templates on there. Socrative is uh, a way for teachers to do some assessments with their students really quickly. And we're gonna look at some other programs that do that too. Uh, in Mentimeter does interactive presentations. So these are kinds of tools that you can use to do specific things. Online resources really means any of these things, any additional resource that you go to that supports what's being done in class or at home. So these tools are always gonna be an online resource. A learning management system is the platform that your child or your student is using to do their schooling to engage in schooling. So your child might be on one of these listed here, which Edmodo, Schoolology, they might be using Zoom or Canvas. They might be using something specific to their own school. There's other ones called, there's one called Blackboard. Um, there's many different types of learning platforms and they all uh, have help on them as well. So we'll talk about that later. If you find your student getting lost or something isn't working, there's usually a help feature on the learning management system that helps you to figure out what's going wrong. For instance, if you can't hear the audio or if the, the, in the, the student can't log in, those kind of things. There's usually a place where you can ask for help. 
the learning management platform is a place where teaching occurs and it has a classroom. It'll have a place for the teacher to input a video to be to go live to maybe write on the screen. There'll be a grade book, a place where you can log in and see your child's grades. Um, many different things happen on the platform. It's like a classroom online. Design presentation software. Those are things you're very familiar with already. Probably PowerPoint is the biggest one that's out there now. There's another program called Captivate that's a little more uh, difficult to use, but can do some beautiful uh, uh, presentations. There's another one called Prezi that's sort of getting a lot of use now. And your students might use some of these or some of the other ones. For instance, Animoto is another one that's very easy to use. And finally, when we think about online curriculum, there are places, and we're going to show some of them today. For instance, we're going to show today possibly Annenberg Learner, and we're definitely going to show you Smithsonian <coughs> that have developed some outstanding uh, extensive curricula for your students, whether you're at home or whether you're a teacher, that are wonderful. They have lesson plans. They have places where you can do webinars. Your students can do all kinds of things on these sites. They have videos. They do actual uh, three, four, five minute videos, all the way up to hour long videos on different topics. Some of these are more specific, like Everyday Mathematics from the University of Chicago has a very extensive um, mathematics program that goes through different grade levels that your students can take advantage of. Digital Scope and Sequence is a place, it's called from Common Sense Media, where you can learn a little bit about how to work and how to be safe online. It's a great place where you can look at just uh, have your kids simply go through a, a program on safety online or if you don't want your children to do it, you should do it so you can see some of the issues in remaining safe with your kids at home. PBS also has and BBS British Broadcasting have some wonderful educational materials for parents and for teachers. Those are considered online curricula because they're designed. They've taken advantage of the media that they already have and found ways to use it with students in the classroom and for parents to use it with their kids at home. So those are some examples of the vocabulary in the field. I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Robertson. Thank you. And one more I wanted to add in, and you may see this or hear it, uh, it's VOIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol. It's essentially what we're doing right now. So a lot of teachers are using maybe Skype or Zoom or a, some version of, um, you know, Microsoft Teams or free conference call. It's just a means of being able to share your voice over the internet, to use your computer speakers and microphone um, to hold live sessions and live classes. So sometimes these are built into those learning platforms or learning management systems. Uh, and sometimes they're separate programs that your child may have to log into in order to see uh, and interact with the teacher. So um, for, uh, I guess our last little bit of um, a precursor or the, the background information that you need, um, we wanted to recommend a basic checklist for parents. So as Dr. Van Avener said, sometimes the hardest part is choosing um, what technology you want to use because there's so much out there. There's such a wealth of information. So um, we wanted to give you a suggestion for if you are searching and you're finding uh, resources that look to be good, uh, just a basic checklist that you would kind of go over in your head or ask yourself. Um, and this is a basic one for parents. Of course, teachers can use it too, but um, in the next slide, we'll talk more about you know, specifics of what teachers may look for when they choose uh, technology to uh, embed into their learning. But for parents, uh, there's so many tools out there that you probably want to find ones that are free or have a very low um, fixed cost if it's something worthwhile that you think you want to pay for. Um, and one of the questions you would ask yourself is, if it is free, is it limited in what it can do? So a lot of these programs will say, you know, if you, you pay this amount, here's all these other features that will open up. So you would just need to take a look at that and judge and, and see if the free version is enough for the purposes of what you're looking for. The next piece would be the safety of it. So you want to make sure that it's a secure program. Uh, for the, the child to be able to use independently at home. 
Um, I, I mean, going to an online chat room is probably, you know, not the safest version, but having a, a, a closed resource that they can log into, uh, for example, something like Edmodo, uh, it looks like Facebook, but it is a secure website that teachers can use and they have a code that the child would be given in order to enter into that specific class. So that means nobody from the outside can get in. Uh, so you'd want to look at those types of security features there. Um, does it have an underlying objective or what is your underlying objective? So if you're looking for something, you know, I, I need to teach my child how to do their, their um, maybe four times tables, or uh, I, I want to motivate my child to stay on task when they're working uh, independently. Think about what that objective is. And then you would ask yourself, does this resource or does this technology allow me to do that? Um, does it fit your child's needs and learning goals? And is it easy to install and use so that the child can do it without assistance? If you are having a hard time as a parent stumbling through figuring out how to use it, your, your child um, most likely will also struggle, um, especially if some sort of troubleshooting issue comes up. So those are just some basic questions uh, that you can ask yourself as a parent before you're choosing technology to use at home. I'll add to that by saying that, <clears throat> excuse me, we, um, it, for the last 30 years in the field of technology, we've probably even before that, one of the, the goals has been to achieve what they call transparency. And that means that platforms are all work similarly. There's nothing difficult about logging on anywhere. Software is easy to use. Everything is simple. We have not gotten there. I think we probably won't get there because uh, of the, the market. The marketplace drives whether or not we achieve transparency because everyone's trying to get the consumer. They want that person to be using their software or their hardware or whatever it may be going onto their site. And so transparency as soon as they start sharing too many things, then they no longer have something unique. So when you're looking at the software or the website or whatever you might be viewing, look for the degree to which it is transparent, meaning that it works with other things as well. And it's not something that's so complicated <clears throat> that it's hard for you to make work. <clears throat> Pardon me. I, I truly ask you to forgive me for that coughing. Um, so this, we talked about what parents might look for when they're examining whether a software would work with their kids, but how about teachers? Um, now, parents, you might want to use this as well. This is a review instrument um, called LORI, which is the Learning Object Review Instrument. There are some much more detailed software evaluation instruments as well that go into um, hundreds of characteristics, but we're just going to look at these few on this one. And for teachers, this would be, is the, is the content quality accurate? Is it balanced? Does it fit appropriately with your students, with the classroom, with the, the topics? Uh, accuracy is probably the most important. So we wanna make sure that it's current and accurate. Are the learning goals aligned to the other things that you're doing? And are they aligned with each other to the activities? Do they match the goals? Uh, do the assessments make sense? Or do they work for your learners? Uh, and this is sometimes a place to think about, uh, is this the type of software that is appropriate for my learner? Sometimes drill and practice software, which still exists uh, very heavily, is quite appropriate for uh, certain tasks and certain grade levels and age levels, but it's not appropriate in other situations. So we want children to be thinking more in a problem solving way. And so that might not work. So we have to think about what are we, what's our goal here? And is this a resource or online activity the right thing. We want to see what type of feedback is being offered. Is there a, re a remediation offered? If the student does something um, incorrect, does it just say wrong or does it not give any feedback at all or does it correct um, with giving more information, which would be really good re remediation? Uh, can you adapt the content as the teacher? Can you change it and customize it for your classroom? Oh, what kind of feedback are you getting and how much is it driven by the learner? Some of the more advanced programs today that are drawing on AI are going to pull from huge databases of information and be able to custom, customize what's shown to the learner by the learner's previous responses. So uh, you'll see some very sophisticated programs and one of the considerations is, does this work 
with my students. Motivating, how, pop, how motivating is it? And that is, is a lot of, that feature is determined also by age and by grade and by um, maturation of your student. Because uh, I, I recently showed an algebra program to my instructional design, my PhD level instructional design course. And it was teaching how to design formulas in algebra, but it had some really severe problems because on the screen it was designed for um, middle, higher, higher grade middle school students. And, but it had very bright uh, primary colors. It had things bouncing across the screen constantly and lot loud noises like boing, bing, 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 bing. And it was annoying to the users because they were more sophisticated and wanted something that was not quite as, that wasn't the type of motivation that was getting them involved. That sort of motivation we see more with younger students or we saw that many years ago. So our, our student population is more sophisticated now and they are looking for different things. So when you look at a program as a parent or a teacher, um, is the motivation appropriate for the group of learners? What's the presentation like? The things I just mentioned fit in there too. Uh, is the visual or auditory information appropriate to what they're learning and, uh, to their, and, and for their grade level and so forth? Does it enhance learning? Sometimes if you have a voice talking over um, moving information or, or video, it can actually detract from it because the student might be paying attention to the words and not listening to what's happening or viewing what's happening on the screen. Sometimes if it's designed well and it's simply larger words that are point out simple things, it can help and it can enhance learning. Um, how, how, how easy is it to navigate? I mentioned that a minute ago. How accessible is it for learners who might need more help? Can you, does this accommodate a variety of different types of learners? Does it have options for different controls? And um, reusability, I'm not gonna go into that right now. And standards compliance, we're gonna talk about on the next screen. So go ahead, Dr. Robertson. I will not discuss these in length, but teachers, if you're listening, these are some places to go to get more information on the standards and what we're looking for in quality online programs for, for uh, use in education. Parents, you might be interested in these too. Um, both of these websites and the, the one on the bottom as well will show you what we're looking for in quality instruction and they go more deeply than the nine elements I just showed. All right, guys, now we're gonna get into the fun stuff here a little bit, which is looking at some of these resources and um, that, that'll be the, what will take up, I guess, this last half of our presentation. So the first one that I wanted to point out, and this would be a great one for parents and teachers, uh, the website is up on top, it's elearningindustry.com. And this has over 300 free tools for teachers. I'm not gonna click on this website because I did make a little video kind of showing you what it looks like. But what I wanted to explain uh, when you go to this website is that it breaks the categories into the types of tools uh, that you are looking for. So there are tons of free resources on uh, creating infographics or um, free resources where students can create learning portfolios. There are free resources on uh, speech to text or audio notes. Uh, so something like yeah, students are watching a video and they can click on your notes or they're reading an article and they click on your notes and you can record for them, uh, you know, a note or something you want to say about what they've read. There are free resources for digital storytelling. There are podcasts. There are free surveys, polls, and quizzes that you can embed into your learning. Um, I'm going to show you an example of a screen capturing tool, which is a great way to do, uh, for example, a mini lecture or an instructional video that all of the students can get. They click on it, they can hear your instructions, they can watch it as many times as they want to, um, and, and it kind of it helps them interact a little more than you sitting in a Zoom conference, <laughs> talking and talking and talking. Uh, there are free websites for social bookmarking, for um, putting 
students can put sticky notes on websites or things that they read. Uh, there's bibliographies and citations, ways to edit images and photos, um, conferencing tools, authoring tools, annotation tools. Um, there's uh, free websites for stock photos. So if you're looking to create, uh, you know, a fun activity or assignment and you're looking for photos to put in there or music to put in there, um, there there's a lot of excellent tools on this website. So um, this I also wanted to list out for you guys uh, because a lot of times you may not know what it is you are looking for. So you may see from these uh, lists of categories that, hey, you know, a sticky note or um, helping my students annotate a, um, a book chapter that I'm sending them. That's what I really want them to do. Uh, and then it can draw you to where those uh, free tools are. So one of the demonstrations that I wanted to show you today, and I created a little bit, a little video is a screen capture tool. And I love these tools because it allows you to record your voice to record uh, anything that you choose to show from your computer. Uh, the one that I'm going to show you allows you to do little five minute video clips. Uh, you can do as many as you want, but the maximum length is five minutes. So it's very good to use for maybe navigational instructions or troubleshooting. Um, if you have a parent that is struggling with maybe checking their child's grades, you could do a little um, five minute video or less showing them where to go to actually check their child's grades, send it to them and they can watch it. Um, this technology that I'm gonna show you is very easy to upload uh, and it gives you an immediate link once your video is done that you can email out. So uh, again, what I'm suggesting is that you use it for uh, parental support, for a little mini lesson, for direct instruction, um, maybe to leave a note for your child as they're working um, on their work. Uh, but the, what I'm going to show you is called, um, it used to be called Jing. It is now called Capture. Uh, so let me go ahead to my video that I created. Get rid of our poll. All right, and here we go. And this is what it looks like. So you can see on the top, it says Tech Smith Screencast. Uh, so this is the video I created the other day, and this is uh, the link for it. Hello, everybody. Just wanted to do a quick video to demonstrate a really neat screen capture tool that allows you to capture uh, anything on your computer screen and then audio record your voice. And it's very easy to send out as a little mini instructional video. Uh, so this would be a great opportunity for you to do a demonstration or a mini lesson. Uh, or even to send instructions on how to navigate uh, technology or a little troubleshooting if there's a parent or student that's having a hard time. So this uh, software is called Capture from TechSmith. It was formerly known as Jing. It is a very simple download process uh, where you create a free account um, and then you download it as a software onto your desktop. So I have a Mac and I would click Mac download. It tells you exactly where to go um, in order to open up this uh, technology once it's downloaded and you just agree to the terms. It verifies the tool and I'm gonna skip this because I already have it downloaded, but um, you'll be able to simply drag the new uh, software onto your, your desktop or your computer and open it as needed. So when it's on here, if you look at the bottom, this is what the tech capture tool looks like. Uh, you open it up, pretty much has you click a red button, you drag a box around what you want to share. Uh, you hit record, and as long as your mic and speakers are on, uh, then you'll be able to talk just like I'm doing. So one of the things that I wanted to show you here um, from the slide that we talked about previously uh, is the 321 free tools for teachers from the e-learning industry. And I thought this was a really neat website to show you guys. And I know we went over the different um, varieties of tools that are on uh, this 
website for you, uh, but you can see here how they're all broken down into different uses, podcast sticky notes, web conferencing tools, and these are all free uh, tools that teachers can use or parents can use. Uh, and then as you go through, it breaks down and gives you a little description of all of these different tools so that you can align them for your purposes. Uh, so again, uh, just a little uh, mini demonstration of the capture tool from TechSmith uh, and then the e-learning industry website with a bunch of great free multimedia resources. Right, and let me pull this back up. So um, again, uh, you guys are able to see how easy that was, a little uh, demo of the screen capture tool. And again, I, I can't explain how easy it is just uh, literally dragging a box around what you want to present. So if you're a teacher and you have, you know, a few PowerPoint slides that you want to go over with the students and you want to record them um, and send it to the, the kids later on, uh, you just drag that box around your PowerPoint slides, you hit record and you talk away, um, go through the slides, whatever you want to go through. Uh, it gives you a link and an example of what it gives me is right here at the bottom, the www.screencast.com. Uh, the kids do not need to have accounts in order to view that link. It sends it out as an MP3. Uh, so it's a really nice way that anybody could just, um, you know, in an email or embed it into the learning management system um, and they can just click on it and watch. All right, and as I told you, uh, here's our periodic agenda. So congratulations, you are over halfway through. Uh, and again, we're gonna get into some of these, um, I guess more visually appealing uh, resources that Dr. Van Avenner is going to um, share with us next. <laughs> okay, um, for parents, First of all, if you ever have to fix your sink, you go to YouTube to do it. And the same thing would apply to things you want to do with your students. Go to YouTube and see what's out there. There are some fascinating things there existing already. If you need help, go to the LMS platform. If you have problems using that, ask for help on there, which is usually a button on the home screen. If your student can't log in or they have a problem with their password, whatever, that help is usually there. But as far as things that you can do with them for education, we're going to look at a few of these now. and. Um, we're not going to go deeply into them, but you can see how you could use them in the classroom. Let's go to Vokey first. This is an avatar maker. Your kids are probably very familiar with avatars. They've probably used them on their phones and they're highly motivating because they use them all the time in the real world and it lets them create a little character that looks like them. Some of you might have your own avatars and it looks pretty much very simple. If we go down here, let's do watch the video right there. We believe that learning should be an enjoyable experience for every child. That educators are the sculptors of tomorrow's greatness. And with engagement, collaboration, and confidence, any lesson can be an adventure. Welcome to Vokey. Vokey is a powerful learning tool designed for the evolving 21st century classroom. With Vokey, students and teachers alike can transform themselves into talking cartoon characters, animals, or historical figures, just to name a few. Getting started with Vokey couldn't be easier. Just choose your favorite character, hit the record button, and start speaking. What is 8 times 10? Vokey also includes amazing tools to help teachers incorporate Vokey avatars into class lessons with creativity and ease. With Presenter, teachers can create animated presentations that students will love. Vokey's classroom tool makes it simple to manage your students' Vokey assignments. With a Vokey school license, administrators can centrally manage Vokey accounts and resources for their entire school. Okay, Dr. Robertson, you can stop it. Lesson. Um, the interesting thing about Vokey, and I think the thing that your kids might like, is that um, Vokey is one of these places where they can create a character that looks like them. It can be used in the classroom. The teacher can drop it into things that he or she is creating. Vokey can be used as a class site, or your kids can use it at home to just do things that are motivating for themselves. It can be used in a, a report. It can be used, Vokey can be dropped into other things. So it's really kind of interesting how you can create these avatars. Now, 
it's one of those sites where you have to consider, do you want to pay for it? Because there are some free avatars that you can use from the start. You can develop avatars to some degree, or they ask you to pay. I think it's a very small fee if you want to get into the more advanced features of Vokey. And it might be a dollar or two. I'm not sure what the what the costs are on, on that, of maybe $5 a month, or sometimes there's a year you get for $5 on some of these things. Um, they're trying to just get your commitment to using it. Now, this is another one that's called Pixton. And um, this is also for, um, this is for students to use in the classroom. If we scroll down there and let's take a look at some of the things they do in Pixton, you can create comic books and teachers can use it. Does it scroll, Dr. Robertson? No. No, nope. okay, take, let's take a look at, um, and hang on just a second. Go to uh, for students. Um, how will you be using Pixton? Let's just say on my own. And it lets you create your own comic. In this one also, you can create and see over here on the left hand side, it says uh, try it for free. And if you scroll down, it's going to give you a little more about that. Um, click on the uh, start button. It shows how you click and drag to create the comic book characters movements and you can create the character itself and it can look like you. So then you have the character doing things. You select a background and you can actually you're creating a little book and then you can put text in it. And you can make these books interactive and you, they could also be speaking out loud or you can print them out and show or show them online and uh, have them be read out loud. So they've been used for educational purposes and they're also very motivational for kids to do things on their own. Uh, in, for instance, doing things in class. Now, this is one that's been done for uh, education and showing kindness. Hey, new guy, want to play ball with us? And then if you ask your kids to create something that might help them to work with other, well, what's a way that you could work with other kids? And then they could create a, voc a comic book story about doing that. How could you be nice to somebody else? And they could design their own comic book. So go ahead, that's all I wanted to show there. We've got so many to show, I don't want to stay on one for too long. Um, the next one we were going to take a look at is, um, let's go to the next slide. But before we go there, hang on. I'm not going to go into these, but on your own, you might want to take a look at Book Creator and Storybird. These are some digital book tools that are fascinating because you can actually go beyond what's on Pixton, the comic book maker, and create books. And uh, they look just like a book on screen. And then you can write an actual story. You can illustrate it. You can have it speak. Um, it's, it, it may have fewer graphics than Pixton, but it can look like an actual book. And students, many students who like writing find this very interesting. Storybird is similar, and that has more graphics. On the bottom, we have podcasts where you can uh, actually create your own podcasts and then broadcast them over, over the um, internet. And those are some other things to look at for your, for your students and for your kids at home. Go ahead to the next screen, Dr. Robertson. All right. And we, when we took that little poll in the beginning, one of the things that everyone mentioned was keeping my kids on task. And that's something that teachers have a problem with and parents are having trouble with at home, is how do you get them to do something? So we're gonna show you something called Tomato Timer, which is uh, from a company that is um, developed something called Pomodoros. And a Pomodoro is a series of tasks interspersed with breaks. So uh, the way it's set up right here is, the Pomodoro is set at 25 minutes and then at, you start it and it, it counts down 25 minutes. And when it's done with that, you go to a five, it dings, ding, and you take a, a five minute break. You do several of those until you get a long break and then you start again. So you can, do, you can go to the custom timer and you can create as many, um, you can change the length of the activity and you can change the length of the break or we can make a list that will follow. Let's go to at, go to, to do and under um, check, check, click checklist, we're gonna make a little list of items and then under checklist item on underneath title, checklist item, type in book report. Uh, put it on the one on the fall, below that book report. Okay, and then say add item and then let's do another one, checklist item, and let's type outline. Add item, and let's type summary. Add item. Now when we say save, it'll come up on the screen and we see that's our to-do list. And when we click on start, 
it'll create a little Pomodoro for us that lets us begin um, counting down. If we go farther up, we'll see that it's now counting down. We're going to work on the first activity for 25 minutes, and after which is maybe our outline. After 25 minutes is over, it'll ding. The student will take a short five minute break. And we can also go up to the custom timer, Dr. Robertson. We can change the timer if we want to and make the Pomodoro 10 minutes long so that they're only working for 10 minutes. Then let's say they get a two minute break and then they have a longer break after they've done four activities. So you can custom design this to do it any way you want with your kids at home or at school. At the end of that time period, it's gonna, make, it's gonna ding so they know that they get to stop and take a break. And they probably do, they do, I believe the Pomodoro is set up to do four activities with breaks in between, then a long break, and you can start again with more activities. So it's very motivating. <clears throat> and it jump in as well, I, I use this for my PhD students who are working on their dissertation. Um, some of them really struggle with sitting down and just getting it done and doing it day after day after day. Um, and it's pretty much they're writing a book. So when they come to me and say, you know, I'm having trouble managing my time and, and building in time to do this, um, I tell them time yourself, sit down, um, use one of these timers, say, I'm going to work for 45 minutes today and that's it. I'm going to work nonstop. I will not touch my phone. I won't get up. I won't do anything until that timer goes off. And sometimes they're going to work and keep working. Sometimes that timer is going to go off and they're going to say, oh, thank goodness I'm done. Uh, sometimes all they may do during that time is read something. Uh, but it makes time go quicker, which is very motivating when students can see this and say, okay, I only have a few minutes left. I can do this. Um, and then they get that break to get up and, and, and move around. Um, so I, I've also been suggesting this to a lot of my, my students who are parents uh, who are coming to me with that struggle of getting their kids uh, motivated and, and being able to sit there and get their work done. Um, and this has seemed to help a lot. Okay, great. <clears throat> great comments, Dr. Robertson, thank you. I'd like to go to Glogster now, if you don't mind. Blogster is a place where you can help your kids create portfolios. And it, it's, it's like a poster. Remember the old days when you would build a poster? You'd get a piece of poster board and you would fill it out and you'd put things on it. This is like building one online. And uh, it's absolutely fascinating. If we go to the uh, content library on the right there. And then we'll I'll go, okay, uh, then can you scroll back up for just a second? Uh, go back down, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we can actually um, look at some things. Let's go to science. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of these that are already built that you can look at and use in your learning or your students can create their own. So scroll down a little bit. And let's take a look at one and how they look. Keep going. Okay, here's one, this Eucharitic cell. If we click on that, we'll see a student that's created one of those. It's interesting. The name is S. Van, but that is not me. I did not create this. Um, and we see the cell in the middle of the screen. The student's been able to tag it with all the information. They have lots of um, descriptions and definitions and you can even embed by just dropping in, the teacher can put a little video in there or the student could do that to demonstrate what they know. We can even play that right now. That's enough. We don't have to show that. But you can see that it works. And there are scores of the hundreds of these on here. And you can also use templates. Let's go back one out of this. And um, there's go farther up on the screen, please. Look at templates on that bottom row of items. You can select a template from which to just drop information in. So if you simply were to pick one, let's pick environmental studies. And you can have your students create a portfolio of information that they know, or even to use this as when they're studying something, they can put information in here to help them remember it. If they're reading or doing things online, most of these have a place where you can put pictures, where you can put text, where you can also drop in a small video. 
And these are very useful for um, demonstrating what you know in a classroom, or it's just fun for students to create these at home. And then you can upload your Glog to the Glogster website, or you can create templates and upload those to the Glogster website as well. So when you have a child that you're asking, what did you learn today in school? And they say, nothing. Uh, this might be a cool way to recap the end of your day. So let's pull up a template and let's drop in some things that you talked about today um, in school. And as a parent, that's a very easy task for you guys to have fun with together and to talk through some of the things they may have learned. Um, also a great place for them to put those reflections. So if they do have to come back later and, and study or remind themselves of um, some of that, that content that they went over, uh, they can come back and look at their glog later. Great. Okay, let's take a look at Nearpod. <clears throat> All right, Nearpod. This is another place where there's, um, I think we've got a video on this one. Let me see here. No, let's go to lessons. Um, if you click on that menu over on the right, the three little lot parallel lines, I think we'll see a, um, hang on, uh, explore lessons. And we want to do a search over on the left hand side. Let's go to uh, social studies. If we scroll down and we'll go to grade six. And um, there's kind of an interesting one here. If we scroll down on life in the rainforest, keep going. There's a lot of, these are all interesting. Um, they've probably moved around since I saw them last week. Well, anyway, we could, we could, I wanted to show you that one because it has a wonderful video of a child um, describing his life in the rainforest. Mm. I don't see it come, it's, it's, it's obviously moved and this does happen on the site as new things are added. But we could probably pick any of these and see something really interesting. And these are all created either by teachers or by students that are doing something like, let's look at the one on uh, exploring Central Park. Let's see what that's all about. From the New Yorker, here we go. <laughs> So this one's a more of a lesson plan for teachers. You can see that there's 22 slides and it tells the teacher what to do. It's gonna take them through it. Um, and you, what, what's nice about this is you can drop content in to Nearpod and you can stop in the middle and ask a question of your students. So you could even take a video. Let's suppose you have a video of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech and you have him speaking. You can stop it and put a question in. What does he mean by I have a dream? Or you could say, talk to each other, and then it shows up on the screen. Talk to your partner next to you and discuss what you mean by dreams. What might, what might you be thinking about in the world? And then you come back and you, talk, you can talk about that as a class or the student can write their answer in there. Um, so Nearpod is really neat because it lets you take any content and upload it to the, to the site, add more detail to it, add more video, add questions, and create your own inter, inter instructional interaction. So you'll see by looking on the site that there are thousands of videos and Nearpod lessons on there that you can use, or you can create your own. And I think this is interesting for students too, if they have to do a project, that they can drop and drag content. And it's great for teachers if you wanna take a piece of content that you've already got, and then add some questions to it for your students. And this one looks pretty cool too. It's a virtual field trip. So these are all, right. all pictures from Central Park. Okay, let's go to, um, let's take a look at Smithsonian because I see we're getting close to the end of our time. All right, um, now we're in the Smithsonian and this site is huge. This is the one I was mentioning earlier that has so much on it that it's almost uh, overwhelming. But it, as you learn a few places to go, um, it's really fascinating. So we're on there and let's see, um, scroll up a little higher. I wanna see what's on the main menu at the top. Yeah, first of all, let's take a look at what's on. This will give you a idea of, let's look at today's events, upcoming featured events it shows you. And we can go to today's events and see what's happening on Smithsonian today online, as well as at the Smithsonian itself. So as you scroll down, it'll tell you where these places are. There's nothing online it looks like today. Go back up, Dr. Robertson, and onto what's on and look at online events. 
and scroll down. And this tells you, okay, so these are the things that are happening. Here's a virtual activity, the second one on there, be a plant explorer. And that's gonna happen uh, later. It doesn't have a specific time on that. There's some other ones on um, meditation and mindfulness, uh, introducing Sonia Sotomayor. These are actual online events that are happening that you can sign up for. And you can look day by day and go down and see what else is happening. Virtual tour of the Smithsonian Gardens. Um, all of these kind of things are occurring and you can do those. Sometimes they are, uh, you do them with other people online and other times there's something that's self-directed. You go right through it. Now, let's, we can also go up and look at some actual educational materials by going back up to the top. And if you go to explore and learn, then I think I wanna to go to um, educators and then take a look at resources on that right-hand menu. And African Art Museum will be in there as we scroll down. Take a look at African Art Museum, uh, art, oh, African Art Museum on the right, there you go. And on this one, you can do a lot of things. We could browse the collection, for instance. If we browse through the collection, it shows us everything that's in their African Art Museum collection, view the collection highlights, or we could just go through all of this, the textiles, the animals. And this could be something that teachers could use, parents could use when in talking about this topic with their students. Um, we can go back up and th there is something on here for all different, this is on one museum. An educator could view this, or you could pull information from here and for instance, drop it into Glockster. You could drop it into Nearpod. You could use some of the information on here. Uh, it's just so deep. I can barely scratch the surface of showing you what's available, but I want you to be able to go back and use this, uh, this site yourselves. And the last thing I wanna show is, um, where was the one that we had on, um, let's see, the, uh, the slime. Let's go to um, We Are Teachers, which would be We Are Teachers Field Trips. This is not in Smithsonian, it's a separate site. Oh. That's on the next slide. Okay. All right, you wanna finish up this one, just tell them what else there is and then I'll go to yeah, the Yeah, um, we talked about some of these things already. Um, PBS has tons of uh, things. You see pbslearningmedia.org, NASA has some fantastic educational material. And remember, you can use any of these pieces for educational purposes in some of the other things that you create. Common Sense Media had some interesting things I mentioned earlier. Um, so go ahead to the next slide. All right. And um, if we go to the We Are Teachers, the field trip, I think it was the one, um, they have a they're really fascinating Okay, scroll down there. These are some field trips that have been recommended by other teachers. And there's one on um, We Are Slime. It's really, there it is. Let's play that quickly. Luca, on your go. Bring it on. Oh, no. No. I'm Nikki Haas and I'm here with Rihanna Mungin, who is a research assistant currently studying slime. We're thrilled Nickelodeon asked us to talk about two amazing things. Me and you! <laughs> Not today. First one is slime. Yes, the green gooey stuff. We wow. So um uh, I'd have to say it's probably in between. We yep. can stop this right now. This because I know we're running out of time, but okay, this talks about slime in outer space. And what happens when you do slime in a in a in an environment without gra without gravity. There's also a site on here that I mentioned, which has, um, it's the Annenberg Learner. The Annenberg Learner is a fantastic place to go to get full length videos, to get uh, all kinds of historical information. They have short videos that are three, four, 11 minutes, also longer videos. And um, 
lots of descriptive and educational videos that you could use teachers and when you're developing some other resource. Some of them are older, but they're still extremely valid. Um, they're really, really good. They have them on almost every subject area and you can search by subject area, math, science, language arts, history, social studies, whatever you want and different grade levels to find videos that have been designed by Annenberg that will help you in your classroom. So we have come, I think we've come to the end of our presentation and I knew this was gonna happen. Um, anything else you wanna mention, Dr. Robertson? Well, yeah, there's, I mean, there's just one thing. Um, we are going to be having another training in the future uh, in this series and we're going to be focusing on strategies to help with your child's learning whether they are advanced or whether they are struggling students and I think that we can probably talk more about these resources then as well and dig a little bit deeper into some of the great uh, content that's out there. But um, I love this last slide because I know teachers and parents are always looking for ways to motivate and engage their children. So doing um, simulations, sending them on virtual field trips um, and simulations you can find in that Annenberg Learner or We Are Teachers. Um, field trips can, I, I mean, they have the San Diego Zoo. They have all of these amazing places that you can go. Um, there are eBooks. So from Gutenberg.org, I know that these are um, typically a little bit older, but there are hundreds and hundreds of books if your child is looking for something to read. Um, annotation and sticky software are going to help them as they're reading and learning how to take notes. These are all things I think that parents can do at home. I mean, of course, teachers can, can create their blogs or create their Nearpods, but um, these are great things for parents who are looking to, to be involved as well. And parents, I would try these yourself and see how they work before you do them with your kids, of course, and find some ways that you think might work well. Um, there's just so much out there, it's really hard to uh, <laughs> cover very much of it in such a short time, but we will talk about this more in our next workshop. Thank you everyone for being here today.